joining me today is Talib Rashid, who is the managing director of TV Edge. It's a Dubai-based localization consultancy. And a little bit of background, I spoke with Talib three years ago. I don't know if he remembers or not. And at that time, Talib was really pushing on emiratization. And that was before the, the government actually uh, pushed even further. So it's really good to talk to you and see how have things changed between now and back in 2020? What's happening in terms of emiratization? No, so no, thank you for having me. <clears throat> thank you for having me on your platform. Uh, always a pleasure uh, to, to be able to share um, what we are seeing uh, and uh, also the journey that we've been to. As a matter of fact, um, I, I have been pushing for, I, I just realized I've been pushing for emiratization for the past 17 years. Um, yeah, I started off 17 years ago when uh, emeritization at that time was mostly focused on um, an initiative that predominantly focused on how can we get nationals into the uh, into into jobs, not necessarily private sector, right? And the biggest employer for so long had been um, and has been uh, the government and semi-government sector, right? Um, and at that time, this whole emeritization push to uh, the private sector wasn't really um, something common. Uh, I remember speaking to multinationals back in 2006 and they asked me, why should we do it? So it was almost like an exotic idea, you know. Um, oh, we're going to hire the locals, the indigenous people. Let's see, how, what can they do for us, you know? Weird. And, <laughs> yeah, it was weird, right? And I was speaking to multinationals and, and people who, you know, probably – um, in, in the private sector, I've never met or rarely met in Emirati or worked with. So we came, you know, we came from um, for, for, from very far where emeritization, if you ask me to answer your question, what has changed was, <clears throat> and I summarized it in a, in an article I'd written uh, titled Emeritization Between a Carrot and a Stick. And what I warned or what I described was so far emeritization, the way it was approached in, in here in the UAE, is more of the government taking the carrot approach, dangling the carrot. It would be nice if you hire nationals. If you hire nationals, these are the kind of benefits you can get um, visa-wise, you know, you, you, <clears throat> um, you know, what type of visa would you have? There were no real fines um, or quotas uh, per se. Maybe in the banking industry, um, there was more urgency for emeritization. Um, that's different, but that it was really the carrot, and um, what happened was um, um, when the government announced the projects of the fifty, again it dangled the the, the carrot. So there was the announcement of NAFES, and then there was this all these amazing benefits, subsidized salaries, something a lot of employers for so long have been asking me, when is the government going to do this? And then fast forward a year later, what? The government does is it assesses it it launches and it assesses um and it, uh, the progress how um the target segment in this case are the employers how are they reacting or responding uh to to the initiatives so a year after the announcement uh of the project of the 50 then you had this whole enforcement so there was the stick and there you have targets and you have quotas if you don't achieve targets, there are uh, financial contributions that uh, companies have to pay. So um, I think we've come a long way right now um, from 2020. I think there are a lot of interesting um, uh, uh, observations that I've made, and, and I'll leave it um, for, for the rest of the conversation today. But I think what has changed is emeritization moved from the carrot to the stick. And organizations are trying to find ways to wrap their heads around uh, around it. So I'll, I'll leave it at this. If we imagine a change curve, right, I still see a lot of organizations. So the, the first thing you have is shock and anger, right? Um, I still see a lot of organizations uh, have yet to reach this acceptance or acknowledgement stage of the change curve of that, all right, it's here, we need to do this. And I see organizations that are still in 
in shock and, and frustration. What exactly is the block to the mindset of bringing more Emiratis on board? Right. Mindset is key, right? There is a, there is a challenge with both sides uh, um, uh, um, uh, of stakeholders. So you have employers. So there is a problem uh, from the, the employer side. And there's also challenges from the Emiratis or the job seekers and youth. Um, from the youth, I mean, a lot of time we've, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, the interest and appeal to the private sector. Um, uh, we talked about, uh, are they qualified enough? This has been uh, talked about um, at length and extensively throughout different forums and conversations for almost a decade now. Um, and I would argue these are, a lot of these are, our perceptions while we do have nationals who are not who don't have the qualifications but we are or qualified enough but we do have a lot of nationals who are qualified you see the number the education infrastructure that you have in the country you see a lot of nationals who come from the private sector and they speak to me they have the experience but they still find it difficult to move uh in in, in the private sector so from the nationals there is skepticism and there is fear Skepticism towards is the intention of employers, these employees in the private sector, are they sincerely interested in hiring me for the value I can bring? And are they interested in me as a person who can grow, who has needs, who wants to grow? Or is it because they want to fulfill a quota? And unfortunately, uh, the a lot of employers um, continue to feed into that uh, that, that fear and that skepticism in the way they approach nationally. So there is there is skepticism and there is fear. Fear that is, how am I going to fare uh, working um, in an environment that is alien to me or foreign? Uh, in the private sector, very little, very few nationals. I might be part of the 2% nationals. A lot of uh, high diversity. From the employer side, it's really about perceptions and the approach to nationalization and i feel i feel a lot of employers are chasing their tail right <laughs> it's a vicious cycle so how do they do that they they want to hire qualified nationals why oh when i ask why they say well because we we want them to perform better. why because we want them to bring value to the organization right so if you're interested in doing that what are you doing to really attract qualified and experienced nationals rather than going out and saying, right, we're hiring nationals only for entry level roles, only for admin roles and cash, you know, cashiers, your entry level with respect to them, right? So that that is one. And then what are you doing beyond recruitment, beyond just talent acquisition? How are you promoting your employee value proposition? Right. I right. mean, what are you telling me? If I join your organization, how are you selling to me my future with your organization so that I can bring, I can do my best, you know? So I think there's fear and skepticism from both sides. And that is the issue. Right. And I think that is maybe a, an issue in general where people, where organizations do not pry, provide this value proposition to people. Um, and perhaps um, Emiratis, given that they live here, they require this kind of information because they actually live here. Uh, it's it's not a, just part of the journey. It's actually their journey. Yeah. It's different than someone who comes from outside. But then I want to go a little bit of a step back and ask you, what was the problem to begin with? We have uh, we have locals who are not getting hired in the private sector. Is it a mentality where basically um, I want to get out of university and go work for the government? to build my uh, young country rather than go to the private sector? Or was it a kind of shyness where I don't feel comfortable being in the private sector with other nationalities who are different than me? Or maybe it's something else. Uh, what exactly was the problem? And how is the government itself solving this problem to bring in all these amazing talents into the private sector? So the problem could be a mixture of both, I think. Again, um, is it China's? I think again, I want I won't call it China's, and I won't call it confidence because I speak to uh, nationals who are 
absolutely confident, um, confident people, charismatic, great communicators, really, really proactive. However, when I speak to them about, you know, uh, looking at a job in a private sector or multinational company, not all of them, not generalizing, but I, th there is a, a good number of them, the ones who are confident, to, who are really open to doing so many things, are proactive. They change. They've, the facial expression change. They've, there is a fear. It's not shyness. It's not confidence. It's a, it's a fear. And the fear is a common fear that is shared even by expats. Um, if you uh, um, recall, um, job security is the number one concern for everyone living in the UAE, locals or expat. And locals face, uh, share that fear. So I think it's fear, number one. Number two, the fact that there is lack of familiarity. Locals are, the UAE is a collectivist society. So people, there's a high degree of influence, people influencing each other um, and people relying on past experience of other people, right. or recommendations, right? And, um, and and uh, with the private sector, a lot of companies in the private sector haven't been able to hire enough locals um, to who will act as brand ambassadors or emirates ambassadors to other minorities. The companies that have been successful in doing that, you what you will find is it is easier for them to attract locals in right. right? Um, so many of them in aviation, for example, uh, yeah, yeah. there was a huge population there. Yeah. yeah, the banking sector as well. I think the banking sector is a good example. I mean, right. The banking, right? The banking. I come from a banking background, and when I joined the the bank back back then in ninety seven, there was a good population of locals in there. I don't know. I don't. I worked in the private sector all my life. I think I already had it in me to to try out new experiences, right? I worked in catering time, as a timeshare salesman, a lot of odd jobs as well. But a lot of the nationals wouldn't have made that step to seek employment in a bank unless they knew and they saw, oh, I know someone who's a branch manager or I know someone who's a cashier. There is that familiarity that is there. Now, what is the government doing or not doing? Uh, I, I won't speak for government, uh, but I see a lot of initiatives from government and there are different government uh, stakeholders um, that, that that are pushing, right? And you have one main one, which is NAFIS. So I can't speak for them. But what I would love to see more is the government speaking the language of the private sector. Right. And I think people in the private sector understand what I mean, right? Uh, when I speak to employers, the concerns they have are real and those are concerns of right bottom line profitability competitiveness uh, now if the government can speak to those needs those urgent and immediate needs that employers have then this will shift from something that is a nice to have to something that is we need to have this amazing uh well, it's a very interesting topic, but I want to move to the second part of the interview where I want to ask you, okay, we've spoken about the problem now and the challenges. How can we help private sector to attract the right talent overall at Emirati Emiratis in specific? I, I'll say what I focus on because we started off as a, you know, a, a traditional recruitment agency, right? Just re recruitment and headhunting. And that was our focus. Um and uh, at that time when we started, we were maybe the only one or two Emirati run and led uh, recruitment uh, agencies in, uh, back then in 2006. Now, I could have focused on just the recruitment aspect of it, which is sometimes recruitment and recruitment agencies have a certain way of work. And it, it might be described as tra uh, transactional, right? Give me the requirement. Let me understand it. Let me go in the market and find who is the right person, the best fit for you. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll interview, you know, take them through the process to help them onboard you. Most recruitment agencies don't do more than that. Uh, when we talk about employer branding, it will be, you know, the how we advertise, how we promote your positions. So it's, it's, it's almost that, as, a, as recruiters, or if you look at it from a, a recruitment problem, 
you, you know, it's almost you have blinders on. And this is the issue that I find with a lot of companies that have amortization initiative. We want to do amortization, right? Okay, throw it, dump it on the recruit the recruitment department, right? It goes to HR and HR also gives it to the recruitment or recruit, recruiter. So it becomes a recruitment problem. Now, what I found myself doing is look, taking a step back, not because I wanted to, but because I've been required to. So when we first started placing nationals, we started getting uh, the same companies coming back to us six months later, seven months, eight months and saying, and asking us, look, we're finding it difficult to keep and retain them or keep them engaged, right? How do we solve them? Well, they're irritated. They keep demanding this. They keep demanding that. The, um, uh, nationals feel that there's no future in the organization. So these are all a set of questions that are not, recruitment alone is not really set to address, right? So where I think we can start focusing on, if I'll zero in, it will be three things. One, how can we approach nationalization from a strategic point of view? And this is a whole set of questions, right? Um, meaning, if we want to attract the right Emirati, how does the right Emirati look like for us? Where do they sit? What do we want them to do for us? And how is it aligned to our organizational goals? So it's not a CSR project, but how is it aligned with why we exist here in the UAE? Okay, um, or civilization in Saudi. So uh, that is, so, that is one, uh, who do we engage in community? What is the uh, employee value proposition that we want to get out of there? What are we doing to grow nationals? What are we doing to engage them? These are all questions that are never asked. Uh, and nationalization is just boiled down to just a recruitment problem. So I think one, we need a mindset shift. And that's what I was talking about. And that mindset shift, that it doesn't become the recruitment consultant or the recruitment executive's problem. It actually, or concern, it actually becomes a business concern. So the business functions have to be involved or be able to influence and, and also uh, find ways to align nationalization to their own uh, goals. So that's the second thing. And the second thing for nationalization to work and for them to attract the right people is to get buy-in internally and get the businesses aligned. Why am I, see, you asked me a question of attraction. I would have asked you, I would answer specifically wearing the recruitment hat. And I'll say, right, speak to universities, uh, job boards, NAFIS, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I've learned more. I've realized this is, the problem is uh, deeper than this. It's not just a recruitment problem. We've got to set that attraction piece for success. And to set it for success, like I mentioned, allow nationalization to become a strategic endeavor. That's another whole long story. And, I, and, and we, we work with companies to help them to do this. The second thing, the line managers, the businesses have to be aligned. There's so many times where you find the C-level the, the, the CEO or the chairman of the organization or the uh, chief HR officer really interested in driving nationalization. And you'll find a recruiter really interested in, in finding the right Emiratis. But the bottleneck lies in the line managers, the line managers who are probably not involved in the conversation, don't understand why do we have to do it? Why do I have to, now I have to be forced to cut costs to hire national, or I have to get rid, I might have to get rid or lose one or two employees I'm so used to working with because of this thing called nationalization. So what are we doing to uh, bring line managers on board? <clears throat> and the third thing to attract nationals, uh, I would say there is a huge cultural piece. Um, and I, the examples I, I, I provided really speaks to the importance of the cultures, uh, the cultural piece. You know, how is your... You, you mentioned something and you said, why Emiratis are Emiratis, uh, wh why, why do they prefer to work in the government sector right, rather than private? Is it because they feel there's a sense of contribution or I'm building my country? That is a cultural piece that is linked 
to the national identity of nationals. And that is, you know, service, uh, service to the country, you know. Uh, and so what are organizations in the private sector doing, you know, to show nationals that if you work with us, you will still continue to contribute to the economy, to the society, right? So uh, I think it's, it's those three things, make it strategic, get alignment uh, within businesses and focus on the cultural piece. Right. I went, while you're talking, I was thinking, do you think off topic, do you think branding it as nationalization is actually another problem? Yeah, I agree. I, I tend to agree with that because uh, the proof is um, <clears throat> when, when the, the topic is brought up, when, even when I'm out of work, you know, I was sitting, I was uh, working in a coffee shop one day, Sheikh Zaid Road, and this was after, you know, the the whole nafis and the 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 quotas uh, were introduced. And I was working in a coffee shop in Dubai, and then just a random person, um, I don't know, he he said he he saw me somewhere, but then when we got we were speaking, and I told him about the work that I do. This is a random person who had nothing to do with nationalization. Um, he has been in the country for three years now, works in the financial industry and investment banking or something like that. And he had a, a point of view, an opinion, and a strong one uh, towards making the case against hiring nationals. Look, you're forcing companies and this is not good. You'll drive businesses away. And do nationals want to work in the private sector? So I'm not talking about how many people are we going to argue with and try yeah. to win over, right? It, it doesn't, it's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And this is one person. And this person might be able to influence other people. So it becomes, you know, and this is the fear. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that as more and more people start saying, you know, it's not going to work. National, the, the, the government is driving businesses away and nationals actually don't want to work. This is a failed project. So, um, I think, yes, the messaging and the narrative needs to change. Uh, and I have been advocating uh, this shift and change in how nationalization is defined, rather right. from, you know, the textbook definition of it's an initiative to uh, employ nationals uh, in the private sector. And then they added a piece, which is to employ and train nationals in the private sector. I think it has to be bigger than that. I think it has to be an initiative that is designed to uh, do two things. One, develop employees of choice who will work in the private sector and help companies become employers of choice to attract nationals. And the second thing, it has to be an initiative to, do, to uh, integrate nationals that can deliver value. I think when you have this, yeah, if you have this as a, an initiative, then it becomes very interesting yeah. to multinationals, right? So it's we're not forced to hire people as a CSR. It's not CSR or a social responsibility. This can actually be good for us as a business here. Salim, you have done a lot of work for helping locals find jobs in the private sector. It's been a very long journey for you. What do you think you would love to see um, by the end of this decade? You know what? I'll be selfish. I wish I can work with more. Um, I could have more opportunities to work with the government because I feel, uh, and I work with government, but I think the government, and I'm using your platform to send a message to government policymakers. I'm not ashamed of doing that. But I think the government needs to communicate and find ways to speak the language of the private sector. And by engaging people like me, and there are a lot of other people who understand how what the government wants and what it needs, and also work in the private sector, we can be able to enable that conversation and help it be successful. So I love for the government to do more of that, to speak to these agents of change, let's call them, um, who are, are in the private sector, uh, but can do more, more to help enable Emirates today because they went through the process. Um, the second thing, the other thing I would like, I would like to see by the end of the decade, 
that the conversation shifts from um, uh, how do we solve employment of nationals and um, you know getting the right quotas and targets and and it shifts to how do we now enable the creation uh, enable more national entrepreneurs uh, more nationals entrepreneurs who can develop businesses and commercial because I think I believe that is the future. Uh, I see a lot of nationals I, uh, who, who either the choices are work in the government sector until retirement and then start a business or work in the private sector until retirement. But I think there is a strong piece where nationals can really bring value and and showcase this is what national led businesses can do. So what do you so imagine what would uh, what what would hiring nationals be like? So I would like to see the conversation shift and put more focus on entrepreneurship rather than employment, because we would have, and this is the other wish, we would have now employed uh, a sustainable number of nationals. It, it can it will never stop. They will never be okay. We're done with nationalization. It's over. Halas, let's go back. You know, to there no, it's never. But to hire the right number of nationals that is sustainable for society and economy, I I would love that to happen by the end of the decade. And the conversation shifts to right. What are we doing to enable entrepreneurs? What are we doing to enable innovators? And what are we doing to enable leaders, leaders right. of organizations? That's what I'd like to see. That would be amazing. That would be great. And Talib, thank you very much for your time and explaining to us what's going on and. Um, Hopefully we'll hear very good news soon uh, on this whole Dollar. camp. <laughs> Take care of yourself and Thank bye. you. Thank you, Amir. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.